I hope that uh, everyone is doing well. We're about to uh, get started here. Um, as uh, the schedule shows here, we're going to start this Nimbus Research Reunion with a panel of our very distinguished uh, advisory board chairs over the time period that Nimbus has been in existence, over a dozen years. Then we'll go on to some remarks from uh, the leadership uh, and uh, then we'll have a panel of former postdoctoral fellows and then move on to a uh, informal uh, set of discussions in Sokoko in what we call Nimbus Interactive in which you can move around and interact with people in a wide variety of rooms that we have set up about past events. So that's the schedule for, uh, for today. Um, so it is uh, my pleasure to uh, have you join us here. I will point out that uh, there is a, a chat um, and a Q&A and what we're going to try to do for this first panel is to ask you to put questions into the chat uh, or the Q&A. Um, it probably is better if everyone uses the Q&A uh, and uh, the, the process is that I've asked all of our panelists to think about one of the things that they really uh, took away from their experiences at Nimbus, one of the things that they learned or thought was one of the more interesting research or education initiatives that we carried out. And then to say something about the future in the sense of what are some of the open, interesting questions that they think, uh, particularly those who may be uh, new to the fields uh, at the interfa interface of uh, quantitative ideas and the life sciences might take away and think about for either themselves or their students. Um, so that's the, the plan for today. And I'm going to start off by uh, introducing our advisory, uh, former advisory board chairs. I've asked them to each to sort of keep their remarks to about five minutes or so. And then uh, we'll, at the end of this, have a about 15 minutes for discussion about any of the points. I'll start with the panelists uh, asking for comments or questions from each other. And then we'll uh, go on and open it up. And if you have a uh, question, please put it in the Q&A or a comment. Uh, and we'll uh, then uh, pass that on to the, uh, to the board. Uh, members, and then we'll move on to leadership and uh, the panel of uh, former postdocs. So that's the, the plan. Um, first of all, I will say that uh, we were really, really lucky to have a phenomenal group of advisory board members throughout the time of Nimbus, and uh, and it's uh, it's a very, very distinguished set of board chairs. If I were to uh, introduce them each as they should be introduced in terms of their phenomenal uh, experiences and contributions uh, to quantitative biology, it would take too long. So I'm just going to uh, say who they are and, and let them go on. Um, so that's the plan. And we're going to start with our first advisory board chair, um, Alan Hastings, who's uh, at the University of California, Davis, and a professor, a uh, very distinguished professor uh, in environmental science and policy, and, uh, and may be officially retired, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so, um, Alan, uh, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Lou. And uh, I'd like to start off first by uh, saluting Lou and the rest of the leadership team. And I won't go into names because I'm sure I'll leave somebody out. And also actually the, the fantastic staff that uh, made all the board meetings operate smoothly. And I also had the, the uh, pleasure of participating in lots of individual events that uh, were really uh, wonderful. And uh, they just could not have worked any better. It was a really smooth, uh, smooth operation. And it was just uh, wonderful and I'll miss uh, Visiting Knoxville, Tennessee. Can't believe I'm saying that, but I will miss visiting Knoxville, Tennessee. So uh, what I'd like to do is to, uh, spurred by uh, Lou's suggestions of what we talk about is one to actually talk about, uh, 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 first to mention that one of the great things that they did do was run a lot of uh, 
these investigative workshops where they stressed young, younger investigators as playing a leadership role in that. And I think that's important for people to set out and develop their own new directions and not just sort of follow along. And then I'd like to spend a, a few minutes uh, talking about um, something which is maybe one of the later activities, something I've been involved in, uh, where uh, it's been a, a, working, uh, a working group and then we actually did in reverse order, then we realized we we're missing pieces and, and did a workshop, which is trying to understand dynamics on realistic timescales, where we were motivated by ecology uh, questions and we are continuing uh, this effort. And it pointed out one thing is that it established new collaborations and new directions, people I had not met before working very closely with, which I think was true of many, many groups. And then it also leads me to emphasize that uh, all of us were coming from thinking about these as ecological questions. So recognizing that the standard kinds of mathematical approaches tended to look at long-term behavior or very, very short-term behavior. And in between is where much of the interest lies and the mathematics may, that's been standardly applied may not really work very well there. But it's also true that when we in particular set up the, the workshop, that areas of other biology like neuroscience, uh, people pointed out that this is exactly the same sorts of questions arise there. And that is an intriguing aspect. And it's one that I'd like to spend uh, the last uh, little bit of time I've got uh, focusing on, which is that part of what led to the creation even of Nimbus. And if I have time at the end, I may say a minute or two about, about that. Uh, is this idea that mathematical biology, in some sense, is a discipline. And that's an intriguing challenge because a lot of what we do, uh, certain people working here is say, okay, our goal is to, to use the mathematical tools to try and really understand, say, an ecological question, which then maybe if you're really doing it well, you might want to publish in an ecology journal. But on the other hand, if that's true, if your whole goal is to keep splitting and only doing, doing uh, in some sense, biologically separate disciplines, then why is there a discipline of mathematical biology? What is it that is common among different sub-disciplines? And so this is an interesting challenge and one that I think is kind of intriguing that some of the same mathematical issues that show up for one area of biology show up for another and trying to make use of those ideas and thinking about the challenges that those represent. And that's something I, I saw challenge lots of you to do. It's, it's an interesting uh, challenge. And maybe I, I probably used up most of my time, right, Lou, you keeping a clock there? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll stop there with except to say that that the, the way that Nimbus came about, it, it uh, was something that, that a number of us were sort of pestering NSF and all of a sudden they said, okay, let's have a workshop, let's get a call out. And it happened within just you know, light speed uh, at that point. And so maybe there's hope for the future that something like this will follow in, in the footsteps of what was, was done here. So I'll okay. pass it off to the okay. next speaker. Alan, thank you very much. And again, I encourage people to uh, put uh, questions and uh, comments into the chat. And, and I will point out that uh, Nina Pfefferman is going to talk about the next phases of Nimbus. And as she pointed out in the chat, things will still be going on here in Knoxville. So uh, <laughs> you can still come to East Tennessee and visit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks a lot, Alan. Uh, our, our next uh, board chair, uh, uh, former board chair uh, is Susan Holmes and uh, Susan is a very distinguished faculty member at Stanford University in statistics. Uh, she also holds um, a, a, another fellowship uh, uh, position and I think Susan is coming to us from London if, if that's correct or from England. Uh, so Susan it's it's all yours. Oh, um, well I'm actually not in London I'm in Portugal 
And uh, so uh, uh, I've been sheltered in place here and caught. And I'm very interested right now in what's going on. And one of the questions that come up comes up today as it came up, as we were talking about um, the future for Nimbus and the time where we were trying to um, define um, priorities were, was the problem of trust in science. And I think that um, what we've seen with COVID and what would go, goes on with um, policy changes that people have or have not done in various countries um, are very dependent on the way we communicate about science. And I think this is an important discussion that we had already at Nimbus. And it's also something that um, going forward um, will be our future for a long time. Here we have a curve, which is a recent curve of what went on with the uh, incidents of COVID. And here you have um, Portugal had um, decided to open schools at the end of December, beginning of January. And although they had very little cases before, everything was going well, the opening of schools um, that resulted in a, of course, exponential explosion because it's a, that's what we have, it's exponential. And what you see is a turnaround, very, very fast turnaround. The, the decrease is very strong. And that's because the government turned around and said, we were wrong. Uh, we made a mistake, uh, please all go home, complete lockdown. And the population locked down within three days, completely, 100%. And the consequent, well, consequence was that it went from explosive to um, uh, decrease in a much shorter time than, for instance, the, the British. So what I want to say is I think that going forward, we have to learn to be transparent and honest and uh, parsimonious, not to spend too much money, but still be reproducible, recycle our work in a way which is useful. And all of those are things, uh, things that we discussed a lot um, at Nimbus, and in particular, reproducible research and the use of R were things that everybody agreed on. Um, and so the, I think that um, at this point, we'd love to be able to uh, see how can we solve the problem or the problems that we have in discussing science and the scientific discoveries with the public. So I think that we saw that the journalists and the policy economists don't understand that science is um, approximation. We work by iterative approximation. And I think that all the scientists agreed that we had an exponential um, a, a phenomena, but the level of uh, the second or third level of approximation, maybe some scientists didn't agree with. And the journalists only retain one message, which was, you see, the scientists don't agree. But we agreed to first order and to second order. And I think that's something going forward where we can, explain it because as people with both a mathematics and a biology background, we understand the mathematics as proof and we understand what a first order or second order approximation is. And in biology, they have experiments, but you don't have the same level of proof. So publication of rigorous work and explain what we agree on um, is really important. And in particular, to be very honest about the fact that in order to publish, we have to say everybody else is wrong, but it's only in the minor details most of the time and that we agree on the essential. For instance, we agree on evolution. We agree on the phylogenetic tree. We agree on exponential for the, um, the SEI R models. And so it's very important to be honest as uh, scientists when we publish and say, oh, throw everything away and let's start from scratch. And I would insist that um, as we improve, there's a point in the improvement where we have to decide that we don't have to improve so much that it becomes perfect and ununderstandable by common people. And so in, in French, we'd say, le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, and perfect is the enemy of good. And I think that we learned this, um, that um, we have to do good enough, but not perfect. 
In the future, we're going to have many, many choices, too many choices. And the way through all of these choices when talking to policy people, I think is, again, transparency. And if you look at how many choices here, I took an example in my own work where we look at all the choices that we make when we look at microbial communities. And I took a typical study where we had 204 million choices. Now, as a statistician, those are the choices of all the different analyses um, that you could do. So there are more analyses possible as th than they are mathematical biologists. So we have to be transparent and publish all our choices, publish the choices that we make about how we normalize our data, how we make graphics, so that somebody else can go by and tr try out a few other choices and um, see what's robust and what's not robust. So those are the things for the future. And I have some references. Um, and uh, But I do think that we learned a painful lesson recently, but the foundations of the discussions that we had about using R and making R markdown and notebooks that people can reproduce studies are going to be more and more important as we use we have to understand how to use mathematics um, in important biological dynamics, such as that of the, what happened with COVID. And I have a few references. There was a, a newspaper article that appeared in the New York Times, which took about two months um, to get straight in how to explain uncertainty um, to the public. And this was published by Siobhan Robert Roberts in the New York Times on how to think like an epidemiologist. But I do want to leave you with um, a hope for the future that we can go through um, better communication and more transparency and that um, mathematics and biology both provide um, the basis uh, for this understanding. And so um, that's the, my, that's all I wanted to, to say, and uh, I'll stop there and um, look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, and I, I do want to point out we are recording this and we will post the video on the Nimbus website, which is not going away. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, if you need those references, you should, uh, you'll be able to find it in the, uh, on, on the website as soon as we get it posted, which will probably be within well, I can, a few yeah, days. Yeah, I can give you the slides to go with them. So oh, that, that, you that would be great. That would be great. Thank you, Susan. All right. Um, next up, uh, uh, our next former advisory board chair is Colleen Webb. Uh, Colleen is a professor of biology at Colorado State University. And uh, Colleen, you're up. Hi, everybody. Um, I am really pleased to be here. So thanks to Nimbus for the invite. And like Alan, I want to make sure that I thank Lou and Suzanne and Sergey, Eric, and all the staff at Nimbus um, for supporting the great work that's been done. And I want to share about my experience, I guess, with Nimbus to highlight some of the great things um, that I think came out even more generally. So I was one of the very earliest people, I think, involved in Nimbus, had uh, one of the first, if not the first, workshop and working group at Nimbus. And from that came um, a project that I'm still working on, still getting funding for and publishing on and working with collaborators that I met at that very first workshop who were not people that I had invited to the workshop, but were people who found the workshop as part of sort of the process that Nimbus required um, for having open participation. And so I think this is just a great example of um, exactly how Nimbus was so successful. Um, it certainly propelled me in my own individual career because of the success of this project. Um, but it had a lot of other great parts that went along with it in that um, we were able to develop international collaborations. So the reach was quite large. We developed collaborations with multiple agencies. So not just NSF and the Nimbus um, funding, but USDA, um, CHS, and a number of other um, international groups 
for agencies as well. And then I think another really important part about the project that I was involved in, um, which was in livestock disease prediction and control or disease prediction and um, control is that we had really close collaborations with USDA um, folks. And also that we did a lot of great training of postdocs and graduate students as part of that project that went on to gain positions in agencies. And I think that's a real contribution of Nimbus to the government agencies that have biological um, topics that they work on in that we were able to train really great, highly quantitative people um, that worked in those agencies. And it's not true for all of the agency groups that I worked for, but for many of them, they really were lacking those skills internally. And so just to have personnel that know R and can use that and talk the language and really then get out of academic collaborators what it is that the agency needs because they can form a bridge between the very applied science that's happening in the agencies and the more um, sometimes basic science that is happening in um, academia. So I think that's another really great um, contribution that I was able to experience. Um, and that also, uh, I think was really interesting and something that uh, Nimbus did a lot to try to bridge or does a lot to try to bridge. I probably shouldn't speak in the past tense. Um, but uh, there's really different deliverables or needs um, in an agency, for example, versus an academic academia, the metrics that you are um, evaluated by are different. And so finding projects and having those conversations with my agency colleagues where we could really come together and come up with um, deliverables that met both of our needs led to really interesting conversations and understanding, I think, and better working relationships between those groups. So through my experience with Nimbus, I really learned a lot. I have this great um, group of colleagues, um, many of whom were young and have now moved on to having uh, faculty positions or science lead positions in agencies. And I think we've had more than 10 children that have been born um, on the project. So it's really great to see um, people having that work-life balance and being productive at the same time. Um, so I just want to highlight those aspects of my um, Nimbus experience because I think they highlight um, a lot of the great things that Nimbus has been doing. And then maybe one um, really quick last piece just to address the question about where um, the field is going. And so from my perspective, it's been really rewarding to do um, this work that has been more applied and useful to people. Um, it's exciting that there is policy decision making that is happening based on work that I actually have done. Um, I never thought that would happen, so it's super rewarding for me. And one of the things that I found is that there's a lot of fairly big data that is out there that was not necessarily collected for the purposes of understanding underlying mechanisms of biological systems, but it can be used to do that. And it creates really interesting mathematical problems because having an accurate mechanistic process model um, within a context where you can do parameter estimation using appropriate statistical analysis to bring in uncertainty when you have a noisy data set is a super challenging problem. But I think as we try to make our modeling and prediction more relevant to real um, situations, that that is a key um, area, which I know a lot of us are working in, um, but it has a lot of challenges to it. It's really interesting. And I think um, it is an area where we can have a lot of work. There's plenty of space for everybody um, and a lot to do moving forward. So I'll stop with that. 
Colleen, thank you very much. Uh, you know, that uh, the issues about data brings up the fact that NSF does have a call out for a new synthesis center on open environmental data. And uh, we're, I'm happy to talk about uh, that in the uh, in the discussions in Sokoko if, if anyone's interested. Uh, and, and if anyone wants a perspective of, of Nimbus on how to run a synthesis center and is thinking about submitting a proposal, I'm totally open to talking to whoever would like to. Colleen, thank you so much. Uh, our, our next uh, uh, board chair is uh, Raina Rabiva. Uh, Raina is a distinguished professor of mathematics at uh, Randolph-Macon College and, uh, and a ph phenomenal educator uh, as well as mathematician. So Raina, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Lou. And uh, like everyone so far, I want to thank you and the leadership team for phenomenal work over the 12, uh, the last, the past 12 years. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about education here. Um, a lot of talk has been written and done on education and everybody is talking about it and very few places have actually done things, substantive things about it. And Nimbus, I think, is one of the places that very early on knew that education and research go hand in hand and you cannot neglect one in favor of the other. And um, I want to emphasize that Nimbus were particular champion for applying um, algebraic models to biology and educating um, students at the early stages of their education, literally even the beginning years of college um, to think in terms of mathematical models that use those algebraic methods. So the first workshop that I believe uh, Nimbus did on that was in 2010. Um, John Junk and, and Joelis Monaghan uh, hosted this workshop. And I wasn't there, but I actually know people who have told me that they have come to the field of algebraic biology <laughs> because they attended this workshop and that it has been this moment for them seeing different approaches to mathematical biology. Um, I, together with uh, Matt McCauley and Terrell Hodge and Robin Davies and John Junk have hosted one tutorial after that and another workshop on algebraic models. And I can attest that meeting people there who I didn't know before really ended up being something that started collaborations. And um, out of those two workshops that um, I was involved with, uh, came out three collections of so-called modules um, designed to be starting points for people who want to teach in their classes algebraic methods to students who really do not have much mathematical background and certainly do not have calculus background. Um, so the work that Nimbus has done um, really is not stopping with those workshops. Um, I know of people who are using those publications. Um, we have collected um, a lot of additional um, bits and pieces of interesting research that people are doing who might be kind of transformed in those uh, teaching modules. And, and the thing that's uh, um, very special to this approach is that you start with virtually knowing nothing, and then you get this fast, fast track introduction to a topic that ends up with open questions and, and the reader is hopefully prepared to read the research publications in that field. Um, I, I want to emphasize something that also uh, uh, Colleen said that the way Nimbus runs those things where half of the participants are invited by the organizers and the other half are just, you know, people who apply to the workshop is fantastic because this way we grow the community. It's not that, I mean, we tend to work with people who we know. <laughs> and once you meet other people, you realize how, how much more is out there and how many interesting projects are there. Um, in terms of the future, um, and on the research front, um, I actually believe that we will see much more systems approaches as uh, we move more deep, deeper into 21st century. 
Um, one, uh, one particular topic of interest for me is uh, the huge question of understanding how uh, the microbes interact with their host, uh, how the microbiome really lives uh, in uh, symbiosis with, with the host, the concept of the holobiont, as some people call it. And very little has been done, as far as I know, on mathematical and computational models that consider this question, that looking at an individual as a, as a complex ecosystem. And um, I'd certainly be the first one who will sign up for a workshop on this topic or a working group, because I myself would like to learn more about this. And I'll stop here with thanks again to, to Lou, Nimbus, the leadership team, the staff who have been fantastic in their support. Raina, thank you so much. And thanks for all your efforts to support this this wonderful community across mathematics and life sciences. So um, as, as has been mentioned, um, Nimbus uh, had very much an international reach. And uh, as indication of that, our next uh, board chair, uh, Jorge uh, Velasco Hernandez, uh, is in Mexico and at UNAM. And, uh, and uh, Jorge, it's, it's your your turn, very distinguished mathematical biologist. So, Jorge, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Lou. Uh, I thank you, appreciate very much the invitation to participate in this panel. Actually, NIMBIOS has been very close to me for many years. I participated by invitation of Alan in 2004, I think, when the panel to decide on these new types of institutes was formed there in Baltimore somewhere. And, uh, and there was the, the idea of creating something that later became NIMBIOS. Uh, I, I want to thank very much to the, uh, and congratulate really the leadership group, particularly Lou, Suzanne, Sergey, Chris, of course, and the staff, Jennifer and Eric. I was a frequent visitor to, to NIMBIOS for many of the years it has been there. And I really enjoy uh, the, the, the help and all the humanity and, and very welcoming uh, uh, things that and, and that happened to me and the interaction with people. Now, uh, NIMBIOS, I mean, my uh, predecessors have commented on NIMBIOS. And uh, of course, I'm not going to repeat many of the things, but of course, in the multidisciplinary work, the way to approach problems from different perspectives, the international and diverse uh, mixture of people that work here that have not only different uh, uh, specialities, but also different points of view about problems. Uh, that's something very, very um, enriching, you say, enriching, and something that uh, really brings uh, a lot of uh, new thoughts and new ideas when you attack a problem. And I think this is one of the characteristics of the teamwork that NIMBIOS has had over so many years. In my time, there was a crisis that was successfully resolved. And I see with really, really uh, very a lot of satisfaction that, and especially for the history that NIMBIOS has, that it is going forward, that is going to grow in other directions. And it has, is keeping with this very live and enthusiastic uh, leadership and ways of looking at things and the ideas that can make scientists to come together and, and work. I participated in many, many, uh, well, not many, but several, of, of these working groups. I organized some of them. And uh, of course, uh, all this uh, is uh, uh, a way of, uh, is, is uh, I guess the main role of, of, of NIMBIOS to bring together people to be productive and to be, uh, uh, to help whatever problems are uh, presented for the circumstances or in the science or in the society. Well, I see uh, NIMBIOS as a, community of modelers centered on biomathematics, on biology, on mathematics and biology synthesis, but essentially a community of modelers. And I've been thinking this uh, uh, for some time because of the COVID uh, uh, situation that we have. Uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, looking at the future, I think that as a community, we have a lot of challenges as a community of people uh, that has have social lives and uh, political and ideological and other kinds of responsibilities in terms of social, social uh, participation. Uh, COVID in particular showed us the role of models and modelers in attacking a very important emerging uh, disease, a 
that are uh, uh, an important problem. Uh, there, are, there, were, there are many situations around the world uh, that uh, characterize the, the pandemic. It's not one pandemic, it's many pandemics. And everywhere having problems of inaccurate and misleading information about models and what they can do and what they are. There have been in the beginning, many, many people started working on Herman McKendrick models, epidemiological models, and, and I mean, it was incredible. But many of them were very good technical uh, people that could do core fitting inverse problems. But the lack of expertise in uh, basic uh, epidemiology was uh, uh, staggering. Is the word in English? I don't know. Uh, it was really surprising, but they were very popular. And it was all over the press. And in the beginning, uh, I was. Uh, I, I guess I was happy because this created a lot of attention on mathematics, mathematics education, modeling, the role of models, the scientific uh, background of the models uh, being transmitted by the politicians as something to be trust, trusted and, and believed. And then later, two months later, the, the whole catastrophe, uh, a lack of, of confidence on models, uh, very uh, sceptical points of view in the general public. And all that was gained apparently in the beginning of the epidemic was lost very quickly because of a, a mixture of factors. Uh, of course, there is a factor of the political use of models are depositaries of truth, of the scientific truth. And if these uh, models are things to be believed, and uh, of course, this contradicts very much the idea of scientific, but that was the political use. Here in Mexico, as in many other parts, parts of the world, there was a ideological bias about modeling and modeling results and how you approach the problem in terms of this is good science, the other is bad science. And, uh, and, and uh, all this means to me that we as a community have a responsibility. Uh, and we need to be able to disseminate our work or to transmit to the general public, to the politicians, what we do, what, what are the models we work on, what are the objectives. It's a difficult task, but that I think it's a very challenging and urgent task because pandemics and emergencies where mathematical models in particular from the biological side are going to be needed uh, well, these emergencies will be only more frequent according to many reports. And uh, we need to be ready. In this case, they caught us of word, word. I mean, uh, that's clear, but it shouldn't happen again. We need to come together and design and think about how we are going to deal with this. We have to have a voice. We didn't have a voice organized. Uh, there was a lot of problems. I think my time is running out, but already did. But uh, I just wanted, I want to conclude that this responsibility that we as scientists have is very important. We, it's something very serious because uh, we need to, in order to get to the people that our developments and our discoveries and our models get to do good for the people, for the problems we want to solve, we need to be able to communicate those results to them in a way that is clear, understandable, and we need to contest uh, the obvious uh, uh, use of the models that politicians and the situations in, in the general human community uh, impose on this problem. So that's all I want to say. Congratulations to NIMBIOS and keep working. It's very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. I really appreciate the comments and it. And, and particularly it, it highlights one of the things that we did try to do, um, which was on the communication end uh, Dr. Catherine Crowley was with us for the vast majority of the time of, of Nimbus's existence and, and really did uh, help not just our own internal folks and the postdocs, the graduate students involved, uh, better understand how to communicate the importance of, of the science that they're doing. Um, so we have a few minutes for uh, comments and questions. There's been a, a number of things that have come in from the chat. But I first wanted to ask, because I said I would do so, uh, if any of the folks on the panel have a comment or question for um, uh, uh, one of the uh, comments that anyone else made. Uh, uh, so let's let's start with that. Uh, Alan? Uh, just as a, a 
quick comment. We've heard a lot of people and, and I think properly talk about uh, COVID and epidemiology and epidemics, but there's another and problem, which is clearly issues related to global change. And they both share uh, one feature, which is that uh, there's a mismatch in the sort of human response time scale and the time scale of the system. For the epidemic, the, the time scale of the epidemic is very rapid. For global change, the problem is anything you do now, if you don't see anything. And uh, I think that one of the things we need to recognize as mathematical biologists and doing the kinds of things that, that Nimbus put forward is not to forget all the challenges. It's easy to focus on what looks like the immediate challenge. Thanks a lot, Alan. Um, are there other um, comments from any of the, uh, the panelists here or, or issues you, you wanted to discuss a little bit more? If not, I'm going to bring up a, a general issue that uh, I expect uh, both uh, Nina and Sergey may, may say something about that Nimbus I'm very proud of doing and that is the connection to human social system and uh, behavior modeling, which uh, I, I'm looking back at what we fostered. I think we did a very good job of at least initiating some of the things that are have now been going on at another synthesis center, SUSINC, uh, which is based at the University of, of Maryland. And, uh, and I wonder if any of the um, uh, panelists we've heard from want to say anything in spe uh, specifically about what you've learned about linking human uh, behavior, social system modeling. Uh, obviously, it's a, it, uh, with us uh, at Nimbus, one of the key points was a, uh, one of the earliest working groups which focused on linking human behavior and epidemic modeling and unfortunately is very much in, in need now. But uh, does anyone have any particular comments on the human social system aspects of, of, of this? Well, if I may, Lou. Jorge. Go ahead, Jorge. Well, just a brief comment. I think one, as you mentioned now, the problem of many of the epidemic models is what they were unable to link social behavior on the uh, fate of the epidemic. And I think that is a very much needed uh, area of research. And uh, uh, the problem is a complex problem. Everybody knows it's a complex problem, but for example, here in the situation in we have, and United States have the same too, there are these different communities that have lack of resources, lack of economic opportunities, and where behavior is tightly linked to many of these things. It's not that people cannot, don't want to keep social distances, it's just that they cannot do it. And this is a multidisciplinary, multifactorial problem, which is very difficult to include into, into models of any sort. And I think that's the challenge and, and, and lots to do. And just hopefully this new, uh, this area will be further developed and we'll be do making progress on this area soon because we need it soon. Okay. That's all, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jorge. Susan, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I was going to say that um, we did, uh, we were doing network modeling at Nimbus and you know being able to manipulate uh, networks has been very very useful in the modeling for instance for COVID but the um, combining with the data so for instance mobility data and data on phones enables us to see a big heterogeneity across countries about how they behave and if you look for the underlying variable, which is the most important, um, it's the variable of trust in the government. And so trust um, have changed the way that people reacted to indications given by the government. So for instance, in New Zealand or Taiwan, there was a, a strong trust um, in science and in very hard lockdowns and very hard. And in the US uh, in particular, uh, there was very little trust. And so um, the, the, the point I think is that in order to be trusted, we have to be trustworthy as scientists and not overreach what we say and be very honest about the fact that 
on the one hand, we have a lot of uncertainty and that what we know one month and what we knew in March um, got updated very quickly in June and then again in October. Science, that's the way it works. And so uncertainty, you have to update, but that requires what you were talking about before, which is communication. And I think that, you know, with the work that you did already with um, Catherine Crawley, but also others in understanding, communicating about uncertainty is really um, one of the key parts and challenges. And that's just going to go through education. And uh, if you can, if people don't understand about uncertainty and about probability, then they can't understand. And then they never trust. Um, so scientists change their minds all the time. So that's the overall message that I get when I talk to reporters. So um, I think the trust has to be built on education, so. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, you know, th those comments directly align with uh, the next person on my list <laughs> because um, issues of uh, how we think about evolutionary impacts on interactions between social groups, trust is one aspect of, of that interaction, has been one of the things that uh, Sergei Gavriletz has focused uh, uh, much of his research on. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it, it's a perfect uh, lead in to uh, an opportunity for Sergei to say something about uh, his, uh, not only his research, but the variety of things that he has done to tremendously lead our uh, science activities here at Nimbus over, over the past dozen years. And uh, Sergei, it's, it's all yours. Um, thank you very much, Lou, and uh, thanks uh, to everybody for joining us here. Uh, Lou actually asked me to talk about uh, challenges in quantitative biology, as I understand them. And let me start by saying that, uh, for me, culture is definitely a part of biology, and also social behavior is uh, definitely a part of biology. So basically, from the very beginning, I guess uh, the main challenge was uh, not really to much or synthesize biology with mathematics because mathematics has been used in biology for more than 100 years, starting with Lotka, Walter, Wright, and, and, and Fisher, and other people, but also to bring uh, social uh, sciences together. And actually, the very first uh, working group uh, that we organized here at Nimbus was a working group on. Um, coalitions and alliances. I co-organized it with Franz de Waal, a primatologist. And we also had Napoleon Chagnon, a part of this working group, and he's a famous anthropologist. And, and there was Brian Skorms, philosopher. So that's what uh, we've uh, been uh, kind of trying to do. And, and I'm very happy and actually probably proud that we've been quite successful because a very large number of activities, especially in the latest years, years have been on uh, uh, bringing together mathematics, computational science, biology, and also different uh, social sciences, uh, anthropology, psychology, political science, economics, and even, in, even history. And um, actually, it's a very good time to talk about this, if I can share my slide with you. Uh, Can you see the Dar Darwin's picture? Okay, yeah, so basically the scientific uh, approach uh, to social sciences, I guess, and to human social behavior and social evolution started with a book uh, that was published 150 years ago. Actually, we will be celebrating 150th anniversary of the descent of man in just five days on the Wednesday. Uh, and. Uh, and, and, and as far as bringing mathematics uh, into this uh, is concerned, there was actually an attempt uh, about 60 or 70 years ago by uh, Nicholas Roshevsky, and I'm sure that people who are doing mathematical biology know this name, because that's a person who founded the field of mathematical biology, uh, of bio mathematical biophysics, who founded the first journal in this field, Bulletin of Mathematical Biology, and who was uh, the person who, uh, whose effort led to the creation of the Society for Mathematical Biology. What is uh, probably much less known is that he also was trying to 
uh, uh, mathematized social sciences. Uh, he was uh, pretty much the first who was trying to model uh, social behavior uh, and uh, using cult uh, and model cultural evolution. And here uh, at the bottom, I have a very nice quote about him uh, from him that he said in the 50s. Uh, problems of history may still turn out to be as inspirational for mathematicians as problems of physics have been and as problems of biology are bound to become. And as far as problems of biology, yes, it really happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s and after that. And uh, history, that's what's happening right, right now. And uh, as a part of these efforts, uh, supported by Nimbus, uh, we now have a center uh, here, Center for the Dynamics of Social Complexity. If you don't know about this center, yeah, please check us out. We have a lot of uh, very interesting activities there, including a webinar a series on cultural and social evolution that's happening uh, well, on, on, on Tuesday. So there is a lot of uh, interesting stuff here uh, uh, go, go, going on. And I think uh, the last thing I want to say is um, that it's not just interesting from a um, scientific perspective, from the perspective of fundamental research, uh, but also from many practical applications. Uh, our society uh, faces various challenges. And uh, of course, yeah, there is pandemic, uh, there is climate change, but there is also environment that we need to protect. There are economic crises, there is social inequality, there are conflicts, uh, political, religious, uh, ethnic, uh, and all these things, and things like that. And these are challenges that uh, our society uh, met previously with uh, varying uh, degrees of success. Uh, so it's not really something unique, but what is unique is that now we have science, uh, modern science, science that can uh, provide guidance on how uh, to deal with that. So it's a uh, very difficult and also a very exciting uh, time. That's all. Thank you so much, Sergey. Okay, I have to tell a story now. <laughs> Uh, so uh, about 15 years ago, when I was president of the Society for Math Biology, I got a call from um, Alvin Weinberg, who was the former director of Oak Ridge National Lab. And he called me up and said, Lou, I want you to come over and talk to me. Um, I was the first PhD in mathematical biology in the US. He was a student of Ryshevsky. Uh, and we had a great conversation. And uh, if anyone's interested, that video uh, is uh, posted at, uh, at Oak Ridge at the uh, Children's Museum. So thanks a lot, Sergey. I appreciate that and, uh, and all of the tremendous things that, uh, that you've done over the uh, phenomenal uh, time period of, of Nimbus. Thank you. Um, so um, our, our next um, uh, member of our leadership team is Suzanne Lenhart. Suzanne is another, another phenomenal colleague who has um, devoted tremendous effort to, to Nimbus over its entire lifespan and, uh, and not only is a phenomenal uh, mathematical biologist, but uh, just as a phenomenal educator um, as well. So Suzanne, it's, it's all yours. Uh, you need to unmute though. Uh, thank you, Lou, for very, very much for those kind words. Uh, first thing I want to say is really that, you know, Lou's appreciation of education, outreach, and diversity uh, gave us opportunities to do many activities. So really, it was that we had, a, you know, a fearless leader that would, you know, appreciate these things. And we did more than 300 education and outreach events. And, and, uh, and you know, we appreciate that Lou... Uh, uh, gave us this opportunity. And also, we thank all the board members for also being supportive of this activity. And I also want to say that I came to Nimbus every morning. This was just like my routine. Every morning I came into work, I came to Nimbus first, and I really thought it was a very enjoyable place to be and see who's arriving in the morning for the workshops. And so I really enjoyed that for many years, and uh, it was good. I also want to thank that I had three amazing coordinators that worked with me, uh, Sarah Duncan, uh, Kelly Sterner and Greg Wiggins appreciate their help. And then I just want to say there was a few ordinary things that people, some things I would, people I would like to think that we had this amazing uh, collaboration with Sandu Hoda of Fisk University and really appreciated that. Uh, we had an undergraduate, um, Virginia Parkman, who did amazing things for us for work for us for almost four years and uh, 
Also, we had some good cooperation with uh, Kristen Jenkins in BioQuest and um, also uh, Susan Riker in the biology in the box materials. And so actually uh, we got to, you know, if you're familiar with these materials, we got to revise all of the boxes and put more mathematics and biology in them. So, and, uh, but we really, ha ha you know, enjoyed many, many programs, especially we enjoyed the, the summer research program for undergraduates. And sometimes we also had vet students and teachers and of course, we really enjoyed having uh, an undergraduate uh, research conference every year. Also, I just want to say that one thing was sort of unusual is that we were able to connect with the uh, diversity committee of the math institutes, which enabled us to have more outreach to do different things. And so one of the main things we did that really was important to me, it was one of my dreams is actually that we hosted the uh, Blackwell Tapia conference and actually uh, so that uh, in one of our own uh, uh, Mario Vasquez, one of our own Nimbus uh, uh, participants, was actually the winner of the uh, Blackwell Tapia Award. So it was pretty exciting for me. Um, um, besides all these education things, you might know that I got a lot of amazing research done while I was at Nimbus. I was actually in 10 working groups and, and, and really uh, enjoyed that a lot, and got to really broaden my horizons. And I should also since say that I would thank my husband who cooked dinners for most of those parking groups. So my husband cooked a lot. So that was really nice. Uh, and I, I do have a lot of people at Nimbus that I would like to thank. And uh, uh, and so here's just part of the list. Uh, Toby and Jennifer and Chris, Pam Bishop, uh, Jane, Eric and Mike. Well, thanks all of them. Really, really appreciate it and uh, really made a lot meant a lot. And I first also want to separately thank Sergey uh, cooperating with Sergey and uh, together we, I think we were really uh, help be a part of the team and really appreciate all Sergey's efforts. And last of all, I would like to thank Lou. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Suzanne, um, for a phenomenal uh, amount of work. And, uh, and I know that uh, there are people all over the world who appreciate the educational opportunities uh, that uh, came out of, uh, of, of Nimbus and, uh, and uh, you just, uh, they were kind of hidden to much of the math bio community, uh, but they were ongoing uh, from the K through 12 all the way through to, uh, to postdocs and, and loads of tutorials for people, uh, not just in academia, but in uh, various uh, agency and industries as, as well. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to um, to share a screen here real briefly. I've got just a, a couple minutes. And uh, so I, I want to point out that um, um, I think that we really, really were um, tremendously uh, helped by a phenomenal leadership team who over 12 years, there was not that much in the way of major changes. And these are all the people who were formerly uh, associate directors of uh, some aspects of Nimbus over, over the years. And, uh, and they, everybody came together and, and really did uh, do a phenomenal job. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as several folks mentioned, Chris Welsh was really the person who kept everything running. And uh, Chris didn't expect to, uh, to be the sort of central deputy, officially deputy director, but that meant he ran things um, for this entire time. Uh, but, uh, but really, really uh, uh, not only helped us in managing all the aspects of, of what went on, but also was our in-house ornithologist who really encouraged people to think about birds and 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 and, uh, and and so that's that's really appropriate. I also want to point out that um, of the leadership team members, uh, four of the members of the leadership team were actually hired by the University of Tennessee uh, in part because of Nimbus and they became part of the leadership and and of course I'll introduce Nina who uh, was part of that and is moving on and thankfully uh, taking over the leadership responsibilities. Um, but also uh, as, as folks mentioned the staff was just phenomenal and again uh, we are really really um, uh, really thanked by the fact that many of our staff members stayed with us a very, very long time. So over 12 years, if you look at this, this collection of folks, uh, they 
really made it possible for us to maintain uh, the level of uh, experiences that we could provide to the entire uh, uh, set of visitors of all kinds, including virtual ones, and uh, and and also uh, just met the variety of needs in a in a in a way that they really took care of uh, of everyone. Uh, and another thing I do want to point out is that uh, uh, in addition to uh, DISOC, which Sergey mentioned, I'm very proud of the fact that Nimbus was the progenitor of another institute. It's called NICER, the National Institute for STEM Evaluation and Research. Uh, several of the folks that are on this picture and were staff members uh, started as part of that, and are still part of it. And, and of course, Pam Bishop, uh, who was an associate director of Nimbus, is now the director of NICER. Uh, and uh, I encourage you, if you've if you're not familiar uh, with that, go to stemeval.org uh, or go to the Nimbus website and we have a link to it. Um, so it, it is now time for me to, in some sense, pass on the torch uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and to first of all, really thank Nina Pfefferman for agreeing to um, uh, come in and, and take over uh, the variety of responsibilities of transitioning uh, this National Institute uh, into its next phase. And Nina, this is an opportunity for you to say something, but, but really my heartfelt thanks to you for, um, for all the efforts that I know that you've made so far in terms of planning for this, but that I know will, it'll take in the future. So Nina, it's all yours to say something. Uh, so, so thank you so much. So, so first of all, um, I wanna echo the thanks that everyone has made to all of the people who have made Nimbus such an amazing place to be. Uh, before, before I start talking as the incoming director, I want to, to speak for just a moment as someone who has benefited in my career and in my formation as a mathematical biologist from the existence of Nimbus for the last 12 years. And so uh, just to, to, to echo the thanks and to lead everybody in, a, I guess, a Zoom silent, but, but a, a known deafening round of applause for the founding and, and ongoing leadership and staff that have made it such an incredible place, um, which then makes it a really tough act to follow. So <laughs> um, on that note, I really want to invite everybody on this call. We're not wrapping up. We are, wrap, we are um, at, at, uh, to, to quote now an overused phrase, uh, the conclusion of the beginning. Um, this, these last 12 years have been an amazing beginning and have brought us together to understand the challenges and to understand what it means to be a community. And as, as Alan said, also to, to define a field that really is mathematical biology. And going forwards, uh, we're gonna reshape a little bit and it's, we're off to a, a good start, but check back soon. Um, what we're gonna transition to next, and hopefully this will involve every one of you and every one of the people who can't be here today to join us is having that experience of what we've been in, in that process of discovery and learning and science and math that has been the last 12 years, we now sort of see where things are hard. Um, and so Nimbus in the next few years, hopefully, is going to become a place that lowers the barriers to doing great research. Um, not just where, where it has been bringing people together to figure out what the great research should be, now our, I think our role is going to be to continue to support that community where those visions are now well enough formed that they can fly on their own. Now we're gonna transition into trying to support uh, making everything just a little bit easier, not from the science, but from the practical nature, bringing people back together when we can, because it's safer again to be in the same room. Um, having the matchmaking of, oh, did you, did you meet an algebraist? Did an algebraist know about that question? Are you that algebraist? Um, figuring out which calls might be great for interdisciplinary work and then helping use Nimbus as a way to prepare those, uh, those grants that might otherwise just be a little bit too much work uh, to do on your own. So being the, that support in the community, uh, that, that now that the community is thriving because of what the first version of Nimbus has done to really use Nimbus now to support the, the ongoing uh, thriving and, and brilliant work that the community can do. Um, so I'm going to be reaching out to a bunch of you to ask you to tell me what those roles should be. Uh, we've got a couple already underway, but I'll be asking for a lot of advice on what it would, what would make your lives easier 
for Nimbus to handle? And how do we leverage the existing community to continue being a real center for where the cutting edge of, of the, the field of mathematical life sciences writ large, uh, including culture, including so social systems, including microbiomes, including traditional mathematical ecology, all of it. Uh, how, do we, how do we use this amazing community that has been built in order to support what we need next to thrive? Um, so I'm going to try and, and uh, help us do that with all of your help and hopefully with all of your love and enthusiasm and with all of my thanks to everybody, especially, especially to Lou and Suzanne and Sergey. This is an amazing place and I am humbled to try and do this next and oh God, thank you all so much. Um, we have complete confidence in you, Nina. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the, next, the next phase of our discussion is to think about moving forward because one of the things that, that Nimbus has really um, invested considerable time and effort and funding in has been our postdoctoral program. And uh, we supported over 50. Uh, I, I couldn't invite 50 postdocs, former postdocs to uh, give presentations here. So we have a, a, a small uh, representative group from uh, various times uh, at Nimbus. And, uh, and so I, I've also asked them to give a perspective from, uh, well, I like to think of myself as not, uh, well, uh, as vintage, not too much of an old fart. But uh, uh, so uh, so this is a, a, a bit of a, uh, a, a younger generational perspective uh, on the same ideas that we've heard about. So uh, we're going to start off uh, again in the order that they were at Nimbus with uh, uh, Professor Fola Augusto. Um, and uh, Fola was one of our earliest postdocs. Um, and she's had several uh, position transitions since, since leaving Nimbus, but is now a professor uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, and, and like many of us, although she's trained as a mathematician, is in ecology and evolutionary biology uh, at the uh, University of Kansas. So Fola, it's, it's all yours. Well, thank, um, thank you, Lou. Um, let me start by saying thank you to everyone and for the opportunity to um, be a postdoc in, in NIMBIOS. It, it's, it was a golden opportunity and I wanted to work with Suzanne and I was super excited to work with Suzanne. And um, coming to the US as an immigrant, I, I remember that um, my first three weeks, I wanted to go back home because I didn't understand America. I didn't understand how to get, to even call my family. But um, with the help of Suzanne, I was able to like make America home. And being a postdoc in NIMBIOS has, has enabled me to not only grow as a scientist, because I learned a lot of things and who I have become today, um, it's because of the fact that I was, I, I am still associated to NIMBIOS. Um, my, my research community is, it has stemmed from the fact that, uh, I, I stemmed from that association with NIMBIOS. I, I was part of a lot of tutorials and the knowledge from those tutorials I am still using today in my, in my research, in my teaching with my students. Um, I learned to, um, you know, set up different communities and interaction with people. Um, as a postdoc, I organized um, one, one um, investigative workshop and the people that I met for, at those workshops, I have gone ahead to collaborate with. Altogether, I organized two, um, two investigative workshops at NIMBIOS and um, those people, like I said earlier on, are part of my collaborate, uh, collaborators now. And um, my collaborators and my research group. And I particularly um, also like the fact that it, I, I could use NIMBIO's um, undergraduate conference to bring my students in to showcase some of the things that we have done and worked together as a team. And, and so NIMBIOS had provided me that opportunity. Um, one of the other thing that I, I enjoyed at, at my time at NIMBIOS was this, this 
this yearly wildflower hike that we went for. <laughs> and it was fun going for those wildflower hike. And I still remember that. And, and the part that I remember and, and still enjoy when, when I still think about it was, was the, um, the ice cream that we have at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, those were fun times. And some of the collaborators, uh, some of the post stuff that, that I, you know, um, that, that we worked together with back then, I saw some of my collaborators still today. Um, Sharon, I, I'm not sure whether Sharon is on this call today. Uh, she's still a collaborator and we've gone ahead to um, obtain grants, research grant, publish a couple of papers together. I'm still working with Oru who, who um, came after us. Um, we'll still have some work going on and we've gone off to like collaborate with some other group of people. And so NIMBIOS has given me that opportunity, um, opportunity to expand my horizon, expand my research group. But by and large, my research community today stems from the fact that I, I, I was a postdoc at, at NIMBIOS. Um, and so I, I really appreciate Nimbayos and everyone for, for that opportunity. Um, so we talked earlier on about, about human behavior. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that I am looking at when it comes to COVID-19. Um, so I've incorporated the things that I've learned from the tutorial that I took part in with uh, game theory, um, collaborated with um, Igor, um, who is a game theorist to do this research on um, application of human behavior with, um, with COVID-19. Um, so um, I just wanna say thank you for that opportunity that you've given me, I really appreciate it. And um, Nimbayos has made me who I am today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fola. Um, and, uh, and, and continuing on, um, uh, I, it was uh, Colleen who mentioned that, you know, one of the advantages of uh, a synthesis center such as Nimbus is the capability of reaching out and helping those uh, who are involved with policy setting uh, organizations and agencies. And, uh, and I'm very, very thankful that uh, Andrew Kanarik, um, who is uh, with uh, the EPA now as a biologist and, and modeler uh, is, uh, is joining us to say something about uh, his experiences and, uh, and sort of cha hopefully challenges for uh, regulatory agencies too. So Andrew, it's all yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, Lou. It was a real honor to be invited to speak today. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to have been a postdoc, uh, the experience was just um, phenomenal that I had at Nimbus. Um, I came in to Nimbus with a uh, already sort of a background in mathematical biology. Um, Khalid Webb was my PhD advisor. So from Colorado State to University of Tennessee um, was an interesting trans transition, not, 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 not a huge um, or, or a steep learning curve necessarily, but one that really opened my eyes to a lot of uh, uh, um, good, good collaborations. The opportunities were just so vast and, you know, really took me a long time to, you know, think back to all of the experiences that I had uh, at, at Nimbus to really um, put together, you know, some of the things that I wanted to try and cover today in my short, you know, uh, five minutes of remarks. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to, to mention was, you know, all of the working groups that I was part of, um, of the workshops. Uh, one of the workshops actually that I was invited to uh, has helped shape a lot of the research that I do uh, currently, uh, which was the actual one that I wasn't able to attend. Um, but aside from that, you know, the postdoc distinguished invited lecture series as well allowed us to bring in a lot of uh, people, a lot of great distinguished uh, speakers to um, to understand and learn, you know, how to shape our careers and 
all of those interactions have really helped me shape my careers. And so I have to say, um, you know, one of the things that I came from a theoretical background in ecology and evolutionary biology uh, with some applied mathematics as a, from our master's degree. But um, one of the interesting uh, experiences that I had was when uh, Lev Ginsberg and Roger Arditi came uh, on a book tour on uh, their book uh, from 2012 on how species interact. Um, and I got really talking to Lev Ginsberg about his experiences, you know, founding a company, Applied Biomathematics up at Stony Brook and uh, his whole Ramis software. And, you know, through that association, and I went up to visit Lev at one point and through that association, I got more and more involved in in the regulatory context of contaminants and specifically pesticides in um, on, on, on threatened and endangered species and in ecosystem health in general. And you know that was that was one of the interesting um, aspects that really helped me focus on you know what I wanted to do in terms of an, a, a real applied aspect of taking my uh, background and knowledge of you know working with applying quantitative tools to understand you know biological systems a lot better. Um, one of the things that really has been something that I've been keen on thinking about a lot has been uh, modeling across levels of biological organization. And so the one working group that I was part of with Suzanne Lenhart on optimal control theory and agent-based modeling to a recent work group uh, with Valerie Forbes and, um, and uh, Chris Solis was on uh, working on, um, you know, looking at going from that almost molecular uh, pathway up through the individual organism, then from the individual organism modeling across up to ecosystem health, um, and and ecosystem and 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 ecosystem services, and you know that was something that was uh, you know still rings true in what I I'm trying to do to this day, um, talking a lot about evolution of pest resistance, talking a lot about, you know, integrating models into, you know, um, agencies, as Colleen mentioned, you know, there's a lot of good work going on at USDA, a lot of good work going on at, um, you know, NIH, all of the funders that have sponsored Nimbus. Um, but at the EPA, we really have been lagging uh, behind the times in terms of bringing a lot of the quantitative methods and tools into um, our current everyday uh, risk assessment process. And so that's one of the things that I would just pose to everybody that, uh, well, first of all, we are hiring a high, people that are strong in statistics, people that are strong in quantitative methods and quantitative biology. But, um, you know, specifically one of the, one of the, more cutting edge research questions that I've been asking a lot about has been um, in terms of gene drive technology. And so um, I've had a lot of uh, good opportunity to uh, to have collaborated with some folks recently, a couple of papers coming out here in the near future on that um, topic. But uh, just in general, you know, working on things that we can't necessarily test in the field, you know, we can't test, you know, pesticides on endangered species, we can't, you know, introduce transgenic, transgenic mosquitoes without, you know, first understanding the consequences. And the best way to understand those consequences are through modeling exercises that will better help us, you know, think about, you know, how the reality of the situation will go. And to echo everybody's thoughts on this COVID idea, you know, I, I, it, it, it was really something to go through the process of uh, uh, becoming, you know, getting into this whole pandemic situation, having the mathematics, under, uh, having understood the mathematics behind all of the epidemic um, and epidemiology uh, process that, that's, that was occurring. It's really a, 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 almost, uh, I'm not sure what the words are, but you know, satisfying to know that we were able to do and understand predictions and descriptions of these types of systems through mathematics, through the modeling exercises that we've done, and then it comes into fruition. Lo and behold, 
unfortunately it was you know to no one's benefit that we are in the situation that we're in but the the understanding that we are able to share and just being able to hear about are not values in the news, you know, on an everyday basis, and looking at the graphs of the exponential increase in the in terms of the epidemic has been really something that Nimbus has has had that foothold in in where we are today in terms of marrying mathematics and biology together. So I just wanted to leave off, you know, science fit for purpose. Uh, echoing what people have said, you know, thinking a lot about the regulatory context, thinking a lot about communication, as what people have said before, validation, you know, defining uncertainty, all of these questions that people have that, you know, kind of weakens the perspective that we try to communicate, but we need to not be afraid to communicate the mathematics, and we have to just push Keep pushing the border, keep pushing the boundaries, and you know, try covering those that, those cutting edge questions. So with that, again, thank you everybody for you know all of your um, all, all all of your interactions and all of your uh, work that, that I've been able to benefit from. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, appreciate uh, your your comments very much and. Uh, uh, for for an, another set of insights uh, into a, a a world that uh, we don't often think of in academia, but there's an entire set of research communities out there that are associated with uh, very public facing entities. In this case, uh, the Morton Arboretum uh, in Illinois that uh, Sean Hoban uh, went to um, after finishing his postdoc and and Sean. Uh, it's uh, it's your turn to say something about your experiences and, and particularly how that relates to uh, job today. Great, thanks so much, Luke, uh, for inviting me and thanks everyone for being here. It's, uh, this is really great. I'm Sean Hoban. I'm a conservation biologist at the Morton Arboretum. The Morton Arboretum is a plant science research institute, a living museum, an education center, and a public-facing botanic garden near Chicago. And I've been working here for about five years. Um, as Lou said, it's a really unique place. It's a bridge organization between science and the public. We have a science department of about 35 scientists from undergraduate to postdoc to research scientists. Uh, but we also have incredible outreach. Uh, we have a million and a half visitors and increasing per year. Uh, and 30,000 students come for um, summer courses, field trips, um, college classes, all kinds of things. And we also have policy advocacy um, and urban ecology research and management uh, throughout the Midwest um, on the urban to rural uh, continuum. I personally work on forest response to climate change, rare species, biodiversity monitoring, conservation policy, um, and building better seed banks and gene banks uh, for the future. I came to Nimbios in, uh, or Nimbus in 2013. Um, I was passionate for issues around statistical power and experimental design. And I wanted to build tools that could help um, scientists and conservationists use their time and resources more efficiently. So design better experiments and also design better conservation interventions. And that's what I did at Nimbus. And it was an amazing place uh, to give me the freedom to do that, to experiment, um, to work really deeply. Again, thank you so much to the staff. I just came to work every day and never had to worry about admin or <laughs> anything. And I would, you know, go on uh, trips to meet other amazing scientists. Um, and I'd come home with a pile of receipts <laughs> and uh, I never had to worry about, you know, the admin. And, and so thank you so much for the, the staff and the support who gave us the resources we needed and the time to focus. Um, so my work at Nimbus, it led to my job today. I'm still doing a lot of that research uh, using simulations and data um, in concert uh, to work on issues of statistical power and again, conservation efficiency. Um, so Nimbus, it made my career trajectory, I would say. Uh, something that came out of Nimbus I'm really proud of is the Working Group on Computational Landscape Genomics. Um, 
I kind of hopped onto this uh, working group halfway through. We produced a really nice guidance document on tools for detecting local adaptation, uh, focusing on the pitfalls and caveats of this emerging field um, and what were the kind of state-of-the-art computational tools at the time. Um, we followed that up with a paper that critiqued the emerging next generation sequencing method known as RADSeq uh, being applied to local adaptation um, for, for um, evolutionary research and, and adaptation. Um, and these two papers, I think, did help reorient the field of adaptation genomics um, to be more cautious in how we interpret positive signals of selection and also encouraged uh, people to develop better methods in the future. Um, at a latter um, working group, we also produced a paper on practical recommendations for conservation managers, how to use those signals of selection when we can actually rely on them to uh, conserve species. And I want to now move to a challenge that I see uh, for my field. And I agree 100% with the panelists before me about communicating uncertainty. Um, Colleen mentioned that, and, and some of our other panelists mentioned um, difficulty of response times for interventions, whether it be for the pandemic or for conservation. Um, I also want to, so, so my challenge though is, is a little different. It's following up on what Colleen said about archiving data. Um, I'm more and more interested in data reuse. Um, in my field, there are now millions, even billions of archived DNA sequences. Uh, the challenge is how do we make that data more findable and reusable? Um, so metadata on where that data came from, how it was sampled, what associated uh, traits were measured, what are the characteristics of that organism that so to inform meta-analyses or, or big studies like that. How do we link that data to um, satellite data and other environmental data? Um, data archiving in my field is still a bit like the Wild West. There's still not, uh, there are emerging data standards, metadata standards, but they're not frequently used. Um, then the mathematical challenge of what do we do with all of this um, huge data that's being archived? How do we aggregate data sets? How do we deal with data sets that have really different data quality, different uh, sample sizes, um, biases in the types of data that actually get archived and whether people are archiving their full data set or a partial data set, um, statistical issues with uh, scale. Um, how do we in or aggregate data sets that both spatial and temporal scale. Um, I'm working in an emerging field called macrogenetics, and this is following up on several decades of development in macroecology, um, trying to understand the, the same principles. What causes generation and maintenance of diversity, in this case, genetic diversity? Um, so the data archiving has real potential for the future, but also a lot of challenges. Um, mathematical challenges. Uh, thing I want to end on is I think the same thing applies to our simulations and models in my field. Um, there are many types of simulations that are used, some of them really complex, some of them really simple, um, different kinds of genomic architecture or demography that are used. We don't have good metadata for um, archiving those simulations, both the code and also the output of the simulations to make them reusable, critiquable, uh, comparable. Um, so in summary, data and, and simulations, I think, need better archiving and, and reuse, uh, following the FAIR and CARE principles. So that's findable, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And then also kind of the CARE principles, which fewer people know about, but this is kind of the ethics and responsibility of data reuse acknowledgement of the um, original owners of the data or the land where it came from, um, authority of who gets to control that data, and making sure that the benefits come back to the um, people um, in, in that place. Uh, so those are my thoughts on, on data reuse. And thanks again so much. Thanks an awful lot, Sean. Uh, that, was bring, that brings up a huge set of issues that I, I have heard unfortunately too many years 
<laughs> with regard to uh, uh, not just data, but model and code archiving and and uh, and care. So um, it's a it's a great topic. Uh, wish we had a nice <laughs> coherent answer for it. Um, our, our, our next postdoc is uh, Megan Rua. Uh, Megan uh, has uh, gone on to an academic position at Wright State University where she is uh, in the biology department. And, uh, and as you can see from the uh, material behind her, she's really gone gung-ho <laughs> Wright State. Okay, so uh, Megan, it's, it's all yours. There we go. Uh, thanks, Lou. You call me, I'm actually just hiding the mess of a back or of a room that I'm in uh, behind this background here. Uh, so um, I, am one, I am someone who is in one of the last cohorts of postdocs that came into Nimbus. And so I bring uh, that perspective as someone who came in when Nimbus was already uh, well entrenched in the way that it ran. And so that was really exciting to step into a place that knew what they were doing and had all these resources sort of already available to them. Um, so I came out of graduate work, which was lucky enough to have been a participant in working groups both at NCS and at Nascent. Um, and so I had that behind me already. Uh, and then when I started at Nimbus, it was a really sort of easy transition because I was well aware of the great things that these types of centers can provide for us. Uh, I am an environmental microbiologist, which means that I'm interested in using tools of microbiology to answer important questions uh, for the environment, uh, particularly from an ecology and evolutionary framework. Uh, and I do this both as a bench scientist, but also as a quantitative biologist. So it's really exciting to be able to take these sort of small scale bench experiments and use math to expand them in ways that we wouldn't necessarily be able to without that. Um, in particular, uh, I like being able to do these sort of small inoculation experiments. What happens if you inoculate a plant with a pathogen and a mutualist and then scale them up to field level questions and even in larger um, questions. And so that's sort of where my background sits. Uh, but with this, these types of interest uh, and like any good scientist, or maybe it's just my problem, I have a bit of research ADD. And so I like to follow the questions, which means I've done some great work uh, with plant or um, with animal systems, as well as with human systems. And so that was one of the great things about being at Nimbus is that this was really encouraged. So I, in addition to the postdoc work that I was working on for myself, I joined working groups with plants, uh, which also then shifted into how growers or so how people are shifting their operations based upon uh, different decision making, which was something that was very outside of my realm, but is something I've been thinking a lot about. And it's actually what I'm gonna touch on at the end here, um, as well as working groups with our, some of our undergraduate researchers uh, as a mentor with Susan Linhart for a group that looked at how hantavirus um, is changing within, uh, within rat populations in the jungle. So it was really nice to be able to sort of integrate into all of these different projects um, given my propensity for following the fun science. Um, but it doesn't get me into too much trouble because I was actually just given the notification today to go ahead and go up for tenure, so I'm very excited. Um, yeah. Uh, so when a, you know, I am at a smaller institution, so Wright State is a public institution in Dayton, Ohio. It is an R2, so it's a research intensive but regional research intensive institution. And so one of the things that was really valuable to them when I was applying for this job was that I had a strong quantitative background because they needed folks to fill that, that space. Um, and so when I came to the institution right away, I had people being like, you know R, teach us R. And so it really put me in this position where I had tools from my time at Nimbus to say, oh, this is a great way that we can work through learning R from the ground up because many of these students, particularly the graduate students are very hungry for this, but they, the faculty might not be able to meet them where they are. And I was able to really help step in and help get them together such that the students that are uh, fifth year PhDs now, uh, which is the time frame that I've been there are completely self-independent and now teach the new students. And so we've got this really great cycle going. Um, additionally, these are, so that all ties into what I want to talk about for the future. So some of the issues that I see as someone who's at a smaller institution is really this need to make sure that we're taking 
all of the, the quantitative things that we do and making them accessible. So the great thing that we do now is that we really have this opportunity to, um, to share our science and why math is important in a way that makes sense for others. And so particularly with COVID, when people here are not, they sort of get scared and they don't really have an understanding what that is, particularly where I am in Southwestern Ohio, those are all very scary things. But if we rephrase it as like, oh, it's just the reproductive number, you know what that is, you know, then the, the, the number or the, the wheels start turning. And so it's been really great for me to see my students who learn about these things in class then go home to their families and explain, oh, don't worry, this is what this is. And then come back to me and say, hey, Dr. Rua, guess what happened? You know, I talked to my grandma about this and she totally understood. And so things like that are really important to think as we move forward. And so that's what I think about is from a teaching and an outreach point of view. From a research point of view, uh, I do a lot of sequencing and regenerating a ton of data. And so something similar to what Sean just said is I generate data for organisms at the mi micro scale. And so we have thousands upon thousands of data set or of little microorganisms in these data sets that we're then trying to relate to environmental factors. And sometimes we're relating them to factors from the host. And so we've created these really intense matrix problems uh, when we're looking at statistically. And so moving forward with that um, research wise is a really interesting field for us. Thanks a lot, Megan. Um, that hits on a number of, uh, of, of points that I think uh, our postdoc program and the many other activities at Nimbus uh, tried to inculcate. Uh, uh, before I forget, uh, Nina posted a note in the chat. I just want to make sure that people saw that uh, there are three or more <laughs> postdocs currently available. You can, I think, still see them on the Nimbus website as being posted there. Um, but uh, there are postdoc opportunities associated with a variety of projects going on under under Nimbus. So um, if, if you know of students who are interested or um, looking for jobs, this is a, a it's an opportunity to, to take a look. Um, so we, we have time. I want to, again, first of all, ask the panelists if they would like to make a comment about anything anyone else uh, just said. Um, I wanted to uh, feel free to unmute and just comment if you'd like. All right, I'm not seeing anybody. So I'm going to ask um, particularly um, uh, Andrew and Sean, who have moved into positions that are outside of academia um, in the sort of typical university kind of framework, uh, to say something about uh, what uh, recommendations you might have for those who are um, uh, listening in on uh, opportunities for students in either regulatory or federal agency or in uh, what I'll call broadly NGO world um, with with regard to um, uh, preparing themselves, uh, preparing their students and themselves. So, I, Andrew, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I'm. I guess you know what what comes to mind is just the ability to to communicate i'm i'm not actually doing a very good job of it at, at, the, at the moment but um i i think you know being uh and interacting with with folks that have that already keen sense about them that have been have had the experience of uh, well, this, I mean, of going to court even, and 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 you know, in in that sort of a, a context, and you know, writing papers in a very applied context, you know, putting together things that are able to hold up to, you know, intense scrutiny. Um, <clears throat> you know, we actually internally at the EPA have what's called a uh, science advisory panel, SAP or SAB Science Advisory Board. And, you know, that's like defending your dissertation times 10. So, you know, when, when, you, when you think about what it, what it takes to become, you know, in, and go the academic route versus what it takes to, you know, 
have your research come back to you with public comment, thousands and thousands of people writing in that say, you know, I saw this on the federal registry and this is lacking, you know, this, or I'm gonna poke holes over here. And then when you go in front of 10 academics that, you know, also poke, poke holes in your work, it's just something that you need to, A, develop a strong backbone for, but B, you really, you need to, um, you, need, you need to be confident in, 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 your, in your science. Um, you know, so that being said, I'm also adjuncting at George Mason University, so I have a really nice, you know, opportunity to both also talk to students about how to, you know, work. And you know, we have the Smithsonian as a really good res resource by us. Uh, O'Rise fellowships. You know, there are a lot of uh, summer programs that even if you know somebody, you can get an unpaid internship. And it's surprising how many opportunities there are in the federal government that people just don't know about. So go on USA Jobs and you know just come through you know what's available and and especially through through the Nimbus Opportunity and and other mathematical biology you know forums every job announcement I'm looking at recently has had a call out for quantitative people people good with R people good with statistics and so that's exactly our job announcements at the EPA are exactly for that so I would say anybody interested in in marrying you know the quantitative and the life sciences it definitely you know look to where you wouldn't you would least expect it thanks a lot andrew i you know i actually see there's a uh, jobs uh, for data scientists at a division of the american chemical society posted in the chat so um you might make a, a link actually uh to to those job opportunities so people see them sean uh, great, thanks. I was hoping you would ask about this because I'm super passionate about working at a museum botanic garden type institute. It, it's incredible. Uh, like Andrew said, these jobs are a little harder to find, maybe. They, you have to look in different places, um, whether it's in the you know botanical societies or um, just different listservs. So uh, they're a little harder to find, but working at a museum botanic garden is, is amazing. Walking among the collections every day really changes your um, they have mind and, and the things you think, think about. Uh, the training needed, just echoing what Andrew said, you know, practicing communication is important. Um, communicating to the public, communicating to um, people who use the science, um, whether that's museum curators or um, wildlife managers and things like that. Um, but otherwise, I don't think the training is too different. Um, just broad training is good. Um, I still do everything from really basic theory and um, basic science to really applied science. Um, so just broad training is good. Uh, the other two things that might be a little different, um, long-term thinking, um, probably both at the federal agency and um, Botanic Garden or Museum, is we do have longer term projects. So uh, we, a lot of my funding is still uh, extramural, so it's still you know, four or five years, but we also have things that we plant trees that last 100 years. So we do have to think on, uh, and we use plantings that are on the grounds now that were planted 100 years ago. Um, so thinking about those long-term resources um, is really uh, good, a good thing to, to start working on. Um, maybe the other is, is also just good natural history knowledge and good knowledge of um, you know how your observations will be used long term what kinds of things do you want to record in an herbarium specimen or, or a museum label or things like that uh, what are people going to need in 10 or 20 or 100 years um, so basically long-term thinking Th thanks an awful lot sean uh that uh, that sort of long-term thinking idea brings up the fact that uh, for those of us in academia um, you know, you're often thinking of a, a one year to a three year grant <laughs> and it's over. Uh, Nimbus is long term in the sense that it's 12 years plus. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's unusual. It's really unusual. In academia. Uh, let's see, uh, Fola and, and Megan, do you have any other uh, comments you'd like to make before we uh, shift to Sokoka? Um, aside from saying thank you um, for this golden opportunity, um, um, not so much, and um, not so much, no. Okay. Well, thanks. M Megan? 
Yeah, um, I do again want to thank you for all in the staff at Nimbus for all of the help that they have provided. But I also sort of want to emphasize that um, particularly when you're looking for students either in your lab or some of these positions for internships that you know, some of our students that might not have the exposure early on, that doesn't mean they can't catch up and do it. Uh, look for students that are motivated that can can do that. So many of my students can now program R, but they couldn't when I start before I started, right? And so, but that doesn't mean they can't do it. That just means that they needed that little bit of help. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. And I also forgot to say this before, but one of the great things that I've had as a mentor is to be able to recommend workshops at Nimbus to some of my students and have them go. And so that's been really exciting too, to feel like I'm creating this next generation of Nimbus scientists. Right. So I have a quick question uh, along those lines. Um, will Nimbus continue to have this summer, summer research for undergrad students? Because I'm always pointing students in that direction as well. So I, I hope it's not bad for me to jump in. The, the goal is yes, but not this year. Okay. So, uh, between, between COVID and transition, very complicated. But the goal is to get back to the point where we can do that. Uh, if you're interested in it, though, please, everybody on the call, not just Fola, but also Fola. Um, if you're interested in sending students to a communal SRE program, please reach out to me because part of how we're going to be able to assemble it is to figure out where the, the, the need is and where the desire is from the community as justification for that, for the effort to put it together. Instead of build it and see who comes, um, have people say, we really need this and then go, oh, okay, of course the community needs this is, is gonna be an easier response. So if you want something like that, please come talk to me. Uh, and yes, definitely the, what has been the SRE program where it's, there's every hope that we're gonna get something like that running again, but give us a year. Okay. And the undergrad conference as well. Give it, give us some time. We got to figure this out. But yeah, the, the goal is the goal act seriously. Nimbus has built a lot of amazing things. Um, but it has been built with the generosity of that initial grant. And and it is true that it is a hard act to follow to promise all of those things without the underlying funding for them. Mm -hmm. I have plans. I have plans. Okay. Maybe They're not all ready for prime time. Met, some of them are, some of them aren't, but I have, I got Moxie. We're going to do this. It'll be great. Thanks so much, Nina. I, I, I do want to point out on both the summer research experience and the undergraduate conference piece that uh, um, Greg Wiggins is on and, and Suzanne are, is on. And this year was an amazing transition to uh, what I think were very, very successful summer research experience programs done completely online um, and, uh, and the undergraduate conference as well. Um, it's, it's a real challenge that is not just um, being faced by Nina and others moving forward, but uh, the synthesis centers, broadly speaking, around the country and, and, uh, and internationally are faced with the same challenges of how you interface uh, uh, at distance and, and in-person uh, educational and research activity. So um, at, at this point, I want to thank everybody on, on the panels who've, who've, who've been on here. Um, I really appreciate it. I'll give you a round of applause to all the panelists. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's time to uh, transition to what we call Nimbus Interactive, which is on the Sococo platform. I, I need to give you a few hints to make sure. First of all, we had uh, promulgated a, a Zoom. Uh, that Zoom link is on the website on the, uh, uh, the schedule. And I'm going to just uh, share the, the screen schedule here. Um, so uh, there's, there's a set of virtual rooms in Sococo. Uh, I, I hint is that when you go into Sococo, whenever you change rooms, you need to actually go to the upper right corner and click to turn on your microphone and to turn on your video. Otherwise, people in the room won't see you. You have to do this every time you change rooms. There's a set of rooms already set up. Um, and they're numbered. And they have this very short acronym in it because they don't have a lot of space to put the other ones. But um, uh, in the uh, in Sococo, in the 
uh, little shared area is a link to this document that has what rooms are there. Um, if you don't see somebody in a room and you are kind of the host, if you were associated with it, go into that room and see if people join you and you should feel free to walk around, walk, virtually walk around and, uh, and, 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 and see folks. Uh, and I will be hanging out along with a number of the other Nimbus leadership folks in the room that's called Nimbus and former staff and current staff will be there as well. Uh, if you go into the lobby, you don't know where to go or you're not sure on how to do something, uh, Jane Comiskey is in the lobby area and we'll, uh, we'll be able to help you, help you there. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, thanks again so much and, uh, and please come and find me in Sokoko and, and fill me in on, on what you're up to, okay? Uh, this has been uh, wonderful. And again, we are archiving this and uh, uh, it'll be posted on the Nimbus website. So thanks again. And we'll end, end this, okay? Thanks. And for the last time for me, it's been a great uh, opportunity to help everybody. And I will now end the webinar. Thanks, Eric.